This is the Young Comedians Audiobook, Chapter 2, Part 2, Carol and the Pollywogs. On one of the last Saturdays of summer, I got a letter on blue paper from Carol in Duluth, Minnesota, and lay on my bed reading it over and over. One of the reasons I'd been lonely, one of the voids that Jack filled, was that last year my three best friends had moved to Minnesota. It had happened suddenly and with devastating effect on me. The McCaffreys had lived two blocks over in a somewhat dilapidated two-story house with an enormous pepper tree in the backyard. I had known them since childhood, the twin brothers Mike and Albert, a year older than me, and Carol McCaffrey, who was my age and sat in front of me in elementary school. The McCaffreys had been most of my social set. We had hung around their dusty garage on hot afternoons or in the shade of the pepper tree playing card games like war and concentration, and we played Monopoly. The three of them had a great sense of humor. All the McCaffreys did. Whereas most kids would just look at me funny, the McCaffreys laughed their asses off at my imitations of Mortimer Snurd, Charlie McCarthy, and Cecil the Sea Sick Sea Serpent. Even their dad, who was a salesman for a wine distribution company, had been quick to joke with us and at least pretended to find some of my imitations funny. Their garage was usually filled with cases of Gallo and Manischewitz wines, and we would use these cases as makeshift tables for our card games. When their dad joined in with us for a game of Monopoly, he would sometimes crack a bottle of Manischewitz and dole out a tiny paper cup for each of us. It was probably just because he was a wine salesman, but he said it was so we would have a healthy introduction to wine and not go crazy later. The summer I turned 14, my friendship with Carol had advanced to a kiss. We were exploring the L.A. riverbed area that summer, the section of it that was still a sturdy green stream advancing between sandbars and cottonwoods, and yet to be reduced to a concrete canal by the Army Corps of Engineers. Several enormous steel oil derricks, like the Martian tripod war machines, stood in the fields near the river, standing 150 feet tall. One afternoon, we all dared each other to climb them. Al and Dale clambered up the rusty steel ladder to one derrick, and, and Carol and I attempted one fifty yards distant. Carol was the most athletic of any of us, and excelled at sports like jumping off the garage roof, or swinging from tree limb to tree limb like Jane and Tarzan. Today she was wearing a t-shirt and cut-off jeans and no shoes, but that didn't stop her from grabbing hold of the ladder and mounting, mounting it ahead of me. As I climbed after, my heart beat fast, not just from fear, but from a sense of excitement. As the ladder shook in front of me, I felt a thrill, as though of conquering something, looking down as objects on the ground grew smaller. It had just rained, and there were clouds reflected in the muddy rain puddles. The wind whistled against my neck and ears, making me feel exhilarated. Carol climbed above me, her bare feet just visible, going faster and urging me on. Come on, Steve, don't be a wuss! She climbed toward the sun above us. I looked up and she was haloed in the sunlight. I would climb after her to the very top if I could. I would follow her anywhere. I went up the rusty oil derrick ladder, scared to death, my heart thumping, feeling the ladder against my chest, wanting to turn back, but did not, not wanting to show fear in front of Carol. The derricks were constructed like the Eiffel Tower with steel observation decks. The first deck was 75 feet above the ground, and the top deck maybe 140. We stopped, catching our breath on the first deck. It was a remarkably smog-free day, having rained recently. Looking down 75 feet or so, I could see the sky reflected in the mud puddles far below us. My hands trembled, gripping the railing, saying in my Mortimer snurred voice, Gosh, this is high up. Yup, we need to go down. 
Carol beside me laughing, saying, You're so funny, Steve, bouncing on the balls of her bare feet, her eyes glistening, eager to get to the top level, a hundred and fifty feet in the air, while I had to repress my desire to whimper and cling to one of the steel supports. We could see all over Long Beach, the big stately homes and the Bixby Knolls on one side, to the east the flat lands of the suburbs, to the south I could see all of old Long Beach in a 13-story white and red 1920s hotels, and beyond that the Pacific under a few scudding clouds tinged purple with rain at the edges, and Catalina Island like a gray-green sea monster lying on the horizon. To the right, the great hulk of the Palos Verdes Peninsula stuck out into the ocean. To the north, 25 miles distant, the distant white thumb shape of Los Angeles City Hall, the one in the badge 714 dragnet credits. A chilly wind whipped our faces, and there were white clouds overhead. Her brothers had reached the first deck and were jumping up and down on it like chimpanzees and pointing upwards, yelling, Chickens, race you to the top! Come on! Carol grabbed the ladder and climbed toward the top. Her bare feet and bare legs shone in the sun directly above me, rattling the rusty ladder as she climbed away from me and the final to the final level, saying, Come on, Steve! Let's do this! And she did it! I looked up as she climbed, my hands on the ladder rung, flakes of rust coming away on my fingers, but my feet glued to the observation platform. The sun was up there, and I had my hands on the ladder round, looking up high above me. She was like a pirate climbing the rigging of a pirate ship. I can remember seeing her up there, looking down with a defiant grin barefoot on one of the ladder rungs, one hundred feet above the ground, with her short black hair riffling in the wind. Not just a pirate, but a girl pirate at the top of the mizzenmast, yelling, Come on, Steve, you wussy! I think it was at that second that I realized that I more than liked Carol. I was in love with her, and that I would climb after her forever to the clouds if need be. I grabbed the ladder and started to climb. It wasn't cowardice that undid me. It was the boner. God help me. That's when, with a girl I loved, 50 feet above me and two rungs up the ladder following her, I got the first public boner of my life. It pressed against my Levi's like the first dandelion of spring. It looked around eagerly, wanting to spread its seed. I wanted to take the next round to climb after Carol, but how could I? I tried to will the boner away. I tried to make it small. I tried to climb up there to the top of that well rig to stand beside Carol, my arm around her brown shoulders. There we would be on top of the world and maybe stay there, I'm sure, remembering it forever. But here I had this horrible, awful boner. I pressed myself against the steel support and imitated Mortimer Snurd. I called up, oh, yup, 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 think I'm just going to go back down there to the ground now. I had to turn around and start climbing down, climbing down a ways to hide my shame, and her looking down after her, but me saying, her looking down after me saying, come on, Steve, come on, Steve. I had to climb down, hoping no one, not her, not her brothers, could see the bulge in my pants. By the time I had climbed down 75 feet of shaky steel ladder, the boner had fizzled out, and I leaned against the last rungs of the ladder, panting and ashamed. Here came her two brothers, calling me a chicken, while Carol was still up there at the top of the world yodeling. Just a few afternoons after the four of us were exploring the densely grown L.A. riverbed, Carol and I slogged behind through a grove of cottonwoods. Carol and I stopped in the shade near a pond that smelled of moss and pollywogs. I pulled up some river grass from the sand. There was an edible pinyon nut attached to the root. I offered it to her. She responded by wrapping her slender yet strong arms around me and we kissed. She moved my inexperienced hand up to clutch one of her small breasts. 
I muttered that I loved her into her mouth, which still tasted of the, of the pinion nut. I know, she said, and we broke apart. After we kissed, she reached out her hand and touched my face, running her fingers along my jawline. Our eyes met. Her pupils looked large as we leaned toward one another. Even though she had a suntan, she looked flushed. That was great, I said, and she nodded, smiling. I ran my tongue over my lips, my mouth suddenly dry. Her eyes were bright and glossy. I had climbed down the oil derrick after only halfway, but she told me I was a good climber. I told her she was beautiful, which seemed to please her. Suddenly we heard crashing, her brothers slogging and splashing through the stream near the cottonwoods, calling our names, now splashing through close by, through the pollywog ponds in our direction. We stepped back from each other and pretended nothing had happened. I suddenly realized that my boner had returned and that I had been so enthralled with Carol I hadn't even noticed. I had to fall to my knees and paddle my hands in the pollywog pond. When they got there, I had to say with visible shakiness, I, I, I saw a frog there. I want to catch it. I continued as Mortimer snurred. Gosh, that would be nice to have me a frog. But still, I left the riverbed with a radiant glow. That was the first of our two kisses. The second came a few days later. Carol appeared on my front porch and announced tearfully that she and her whole family were moving to Duluth, Minnesota. It was a job thing her dad had talked about forever, distributing California wines to the northeastern states. There would be plenty of Gallo and Manischewitz at Minneapolis supermarkets. When do you have to go? I asked. How long do we have? You don't get it, she said, and tugged me out onto the porch. We're leaving right now, this afternoon. My mom is home packing. We don't even get to take our bikes. My dad says that movers will bring all our stuff later. That's crazy. I know. Her tears were coming strong now over her freckles. In all the years of her childhood, through every kind of kid injury, including falling off the garage roof, I had never seen Carol cry before. I grabbed her suddenly. We were like two lovers in a Bogart movie. We had a long and tearful romantic kiss there on the porch. I'm sure with my mom looking out the side window. Then, having promised to write, she was gone. We tried writing romantic letters, full of misspelled passion, but we just didn't have the experience for it, and I think it embarrassed both of us. Instead, I got letters from her about their new house in suburban Duluth, and how the people on the next property had a horse, how her brothers had instantly made the team on a baseball league, and how much she missed me. In my own letters, I tried to use my comedy skills but they looked flat and juvenile on the page. I'd always been able to crack Carol up with my dopey jokes and impressions, but it was different without her there to laugh her ass off in response. So now, in this letter, she told me about a boy at the next property who was teaching her to ride a horse. The letter on my bedspread seemed to doom all future hope of romance. Looking at the letter, I felt suddenly glad that at least Jack was here this summer. I thought of him and his horn rims, laughing at my jokes, coming up with new weird comedy bits for the tape recorder, someone who at least understood my sense of humor. It made me feel a lot better about Carol learning to ride a horse.